we will now deal with the subject of Abraham and Sarah. Let's now read in Genesis chapter 16, the following text that talks about Sarah and Abraham, a remarkable episode in both of their lives. The text in Genesis 16 says, Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abraham, See now, the Lord has what? The Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Look at that. Look at how a person like her, how she manip manipulates her situation, how she sees her situation. Sarah was placing the blame on God for not being able to have children. She was saying, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Which means God was the one impeding Sarah from bearing children. No, no, it wasn't God. There's no proof that God was behind it. Sarah was already sterile even before God entered Abraham's life and in hers. So it wasn't Sarah's sterility wasn't the work of God. But she thought, well, if I'm not having children, then it's because God doesn't want it. It's because God is impeding me from having children. So she placed reason, the blame on God. It's very important for you to understand the power in manipulating the way you look at your situation. Because when you start to create a story inside your head and a negative story, which was the case here. Look at how the problem started. Look at how the problem started. Sarah was saying, God has restrained. The Lord has restrained me from bearing children. When a person creates a negative story about themselves, from that moment onwards, they will start living a life tied to that decision, to that negative story they created in their own minds. So, for example, my dad abandoned me. He didn't marry my mother. He didn't. He didn't raise me. He rejected me because, because I didn't have value or because men aren't worth it. All men are the same. You place this inside of your mind, you will reproduce this in your marriage. The way you treat your husband, the way you treat your dad, the way you treat your child, the way you treat men, even the way you treat God, because God is also a father. So you create within yourself a story where you are the victim and someone else is to blame. So you will always have this feeling of impotence and bitterness, blaming someone else. And that is a great evil in human beings. It's when a person victimizes themselves and transfers the blame and responsibility of their life to another person. When I transfer the responsibility of my life to another person, so I become impotent. Because at the end of the day, I am like this because of someone else. And there is nothing I can do about it. And it's clear that many people, they have an influence in our lives. And we don't have power over this. But we can decide what we'll do with this influence, this impact. You're not to blame if your father didn't raise you. You're not to blame if you were cheated on. But how will you tell this story inside of your mind. How will you see it? This will make all the difference in your lives as we will read here about Abraham and Sarah's life and what it did and what it does today. Yeah.
And what happened here when Sarah complained, 10 years had already gone by, right? It means that during 10 years, she was waiting for God's promise to be fulfilled, that she would have a child with Abraham. And this also happens. Some people place the blame on God because they are in the church. They have participated of the love therapy. She's, you know, they're there. They're doing their part, in other words. Because, but because nothing happens in her love life, she thinks that, that it's because God doesn't want. And when, when she believes that God doesn't want, then, you know, you, you start to get desperate which is what happened to Sarah. She got desperate and she did something that we will read now that goes against everything that she had lived all the years alongside her husband because she was the only woman in that time who had a husband who was faithful only to her even though she was sterile. She ruined she ruined what she had because she came to that conclusion that she she started thinking, no, no, God doesn't want to give you a child through me. And sometimes you hear in the church, you do everything right and nothing has happened. You haven't found someone or your marriage is still struggling. You haven't resolved everything you wanted. And then you start to, you know, question God and think he doesn't want you're going to make the same mistake Sarah did here. So it says, See now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarah. And then Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So not only did she formulate her situation that God didn't allow her to have children, but she also came up with a suggestion, a solution, her way. She finally ceded to the idea, she finally ceded to the custom of that time that when a woman was sterile, that a man could take another wife to bear children because people depended on children to survive. It wasn't a matter of ego, it was a matter of survival. So that's why it was done. So she ceded to that, even though it was against Abraham's will. Abraham had never done that. He opted not to impose on his wife, Sarah, this pain. On top of not being able to have children, now she has to see another woman having children with her husband. He didn't want to submit her to this. But she also, not wanting to submit Abraham to not having descendants, she finally gave in and said, I, I accept that you take my slave. She wanted to make a way, her way, the human way. So she came with this suggestion. And people have this power. We have the power to conceive ideas and think if it doesn't work one way, it'll be another day. If this way didn't work, then I will do it this way, just like I saw my friend do, the soap opera on the internet. The same way my mother did and so-and-so said, she has this power. And a person has the power to imitate what others have done. But look at what happened to Abraham and Sarah. Today, few people notice that until today, the world pays for this. Yes, we pay for what happened. What do you mean, Bishop? Because Abraham had a child with Hagar who turned into the father of the Arab nations. And later on, he had the son of the promise, a son with his wife, Sarah, Isaac, which is the father of the nation of Israel. So until today, Jews and Arabs live 
in conflict. Jews and Arabs live with this confrontation. There is no peace. Since even before you were born, you heard about the conflicts in the Middle East, yes or no? Conflicts. Every now and then, you hear rumors, oh, Iran is going to attack. Weeks earlier, Israel attacked. It destroyed a, an Iranian nuclear plant, wasn't it? That happened weeks ago. So since you were a child and since always, always, these nations, two children of Abraham, one from the servant and the other from the wife, they live in confrontation up till today. Enemies, torment, instability in the world. Thousands of years later, look at that. The consequence of one thought, one idea, one purpose, one way of getting whatever they wanted at any price. And this wasn't the will of God. It wasn't his will. And see the mistake of Abraham. Place there again. Verse 2 says that Abraham, at the end, and Abraham heeded the voice of Sarah. It means that finally, Abraham, okay, instead of listening to God's voice, which had already said to him that he would be the father of a great nation, he decided to listen to his wife's voice. And this is how many people make a mistake in their love life because they try to arrange a happy love life by arranging things their way, their way. The person wants that person no matter if they're already married. They want things their way. And it's by doing things their way that they mess up. You see that when Sarai gave this suggestion to Abram, she was, she was giving a worldly suggestion. She was giving him the option that everyone would do, that everyone was doing. Everyone was, you know, getting their servant. But the thing is, she was thinking that Abram, you know, that, that everything was going to continue the same. That they were going to be in the faith and be blessed and so forth. And if you continue reading the story, there were a lot of problems. They, you know, Abraham had a lot of problems after this because he had problems with her before Hagar having given birth. She had problems with Sarai. Both of them argued and Hagar fled from the house. You know, it was a lot of torment. And you see that 15 years went by around there, 14 years, 14 years that when God spoke to Abraham again. It means that this matter of doing things got in the way. Got in the way of God's plans. It got in the way of Abram. Abraham only heard God again in chapter 17. When, you know, 14 years had gone by, Ismail was already a teen. You, you sometimes think that God will somehow use your faith you know, he's, he's going to use what I did, but that's my faith. And in the same way that God blessed me that here in that area, he will bless me because I am a blessed woman or I am a blessed man. Except that you are not using the weapon that he gave you, which is trust. In Abraham and Sarah's case, when God called Sarah and Abraham, she was, she was barren. And God spoke to him and said, you will give birth to a great nation, period. He didn't have to do anything else in regards to that promise. All he had to do was obey and keep persevering, persevering, waiting until God would do the miracle. But this miracle was interrupted. This wait was interrupted. It probably delayed things because you, you see that it, it got delayed because you see that things stopped there. God was there 
in a purpose working in Abraham. Abraham had already gone through some things, situations. He had faced the situation with law, the situation in Egypt. He had faced certain situations, faced certain situations in life. And God was with him all along. He was with him. But this here got in the way. Sometimes you think it's that God is waiting for you to act. And sometimes we tell you, take an action, take an action. But your action has to be in faith, in your trust in Him. It doesn't mean to take an action that any person in the world takes, which is the case, for example, you're a single woman and you're seeing time go by, time go by. Wow, you think, wow, I'm already 30, 40 years and there is no one. I don't see anyone for me. You start thinking like a worldly woman who is 30, 40 years old. I'm going to have to do something. I'm going to have to find someone. And that's when you start to get desperate and do what Sarah did. When she said, look, God doesn't want to give me a child. She took faith away. That's, that's it. I'll no longer trust. I won't trust, which is what many people do. Let me see what I will do m- for myself. Because it doesn't even make sense if we think about it. If she truly believed that God didn't want her to have children, why would she go against God and try to get a child anyhow? Was it God who didn't want her to have children? If she truly believed that, that she would have to remain silent. Okay, God doesn't want, end of story. No, but she went against. He doesn't want, but I will find a way. The truth is that it didn't have anything to do with God, but you see the persistence of the person. We had a case yesterday, I spoke about it here, of an assistant who got tired of waiting. Single, got tired of waiting for a man of God a man of the same faith to marry. So there was one year on the New Year's night vigil, she made a prayer to God like this in church. My God, this is the year. If this year you don't do something about my love life, I will... (laughs) Look at that. (laughs) She threatened God. (laughs) If you, oh Lord, don't do something, I will. And it was said and done. After one year, she didn't find anyone in the church. She surrendered her assistant's uniform, left church, went out there to seek a man, a macho man. What did she want? A macho man. So she went out to look for him, and she messed up. She destroyed her life. We know about this story because years later, and after a destroyed life, she almost died, lost her life. She managed through a miracle to come back to the faith, single still. But now she was traumatized and hurt because she made the wrong choice. And and just by her prayer, we can see that she wasn't ready for a relationship. Because in order to be ready for a relationship, you have to be well. You have to be well. You who like to have everything your way, you who want to have control, you know, to you who you want to control your life. You're the person that says, I want this, this, and this, and it's going to be like this, period. This kind of person, you are not ready to be in a relationship. You cannot get married. You cannot get married. Forget about it. You cannot marry. Because married life is of two people. In other words, it will no longer be what I want and when I want it, how I want it. It's going to be a partnership. I'll have to wait um, to see what he wants, how we can, when, when it will be. You, you can't enter a relationship this way. This also has to do, it's also one of the reasons why people do things their way. It's because deep inside themselves, they have this, this fear of control of their, losing control of their life, of ending up like so-and-so in order So in order for it not to happen with her, she has to take control. She thinks, it's going to be my way. I have to decide things. I have to decide when it will happen. Sometimes you see women who haven't yet gotten married. 
No, no, I will not wait for a husband. I'm going to have a child because I want to. I'm, you know, getting to an age. I want to have a child. So she manages a way to have a child. The child is born and doesn't have a family, doesn't have a father. It's only a mom. But why? Because she wants to be in control. I'm not going to be waiting on a man. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to be dependent. It, it means that a person has has so much fear of being unhappy that she wants to control everything. And in trying to control everything, that's when she, it, it's, a, it's horrible for the person that gets into a relationship with her because everything has to be her way. Everything has to be her way. So you can't, you, you see this matter when a person wants to get their way with God, she's already showing that she's not ready for a relationship. That's when she messes up. And sometimes the partner gives in like Abraham did to Sarah. Because sometimes the person keeps insisting and insisting. And you have to be careful, especially the woman. A woman has the the word of a woman. If she knew the power of her word, she would use this power in a wiser way. Because a man, by nature, he... He's inclined to please a woman. He has an inclination. He wants to please a woman, even if it's just to have peace. Isn't it? <laughs> even if it's to... And the woman knows this. She knows that he wants peace. And sometimes she takes advantage of this. I'm going to keep doing it until he gives me what I want. So many of the times, okay, you don't want it? Okay. He doesn't have conviction the way he needed, the way he needed to say no to Sarah. Woman, you're crazy. No, that's not how we're going to do things. That's now how God's promise is going to be fulfilled. I could have taken Hagar before God had spoken to me. So he could have been in this position, but we don't know how it happened or what happened, but we can assume that she kept insisting and insisting until he <sighs> all right and you know what happened next afterwards when hagar got pregnant if you read the rest of the chapter when hagar got pregnant she literally felt like the king of the castle she began despising sarah disdaining sarah sarah then turned to abraham and said look you see look what you did to me <laughs> Look at what you did to me. <laughs> Abraham did said, you're the one who insisted. <laughs> Not only did she make a mistake, she blamed Abraham afterwards. It was hell, a living hell. The story is registered there so that we don't make the same mistakes. But this is the power that you have. Women and men as well. Sometimes you impose your will. You impose your will. You even manage to get what you want because, but at what price? What price? It's not worth it. Firstly, you have to consult if it's God's will. You have to use your intelligence. If Sarah, as much as Abraham, would have used their intelligence instead of emotion at that moment, the anxiety, because they were waiting 10 years, they would have resisted. But no, they succumbed to their emotions, to their feelings, and it's there. God left it registered. The father of faith, the referential couple, he left it registered there. Why? So we could learn from their example. So sometimes you, wife, you're all over your husband over and over again, demanding and demanding, thinking that by speaking a lot, you'll change the person's mind. But you'll get a problem instead. When the moment comes to explode, to, to knock the bucket over, then you will say, ah, what did I do? But you insisted on doing things your way. Your way. The man says this, oh, my wife doesn't meet my sexual needs. I, I look for her and she rejects me. Ah, okay, so I'm going to look for someone on the street. I'm going to find someone on the street. And after the betrayal, he blames the wife. Oh, but it's because you rejected me. You rejected me. So, what is this? What does looking in the streets or seeing pornography doing things your way? 
Instead of trying to resolve the problem, the bucket is knocked over and you go and look for your own solution. And since there's no way out, oh, I'll do it my way. Oh, the husband doesn't give attention. He doesn't give me attention. So I'll speak to my colleague at work who'll give me attention. So instead of resolving the problem, you look for your own solution. And that's where you mess everything up. And usually the way everyone uses but doesn't work Everyone uses the same way, and it doesn't work. The only way that God works is God's way. That's the only way. And when God blesses, He fulfills. When He fulfills His word in your life, it's so, so divine. It fits so perfectly. When, when it's from God, when you, you see later on, Sarah have a child, when you have God's promise being fulfilled in your life, you forget everything you went through. It's like it was all worth it. I imagine that for Clayton, those 10 years he did the love therapy were worth it. All those years that the person was there being faithful, trusting God, they were worth it. But for you to have this, to achieve this from God, you must trust in him. You have to wait for His will to be done. His way is not the same as this world's. It's not. The biggest insult for God is when the person gives in to anxiety, when she gives in to distrust. She shows an unbelief. For you to have an idea of this, when someone asks you for something, someone asks you for something, and you say, yes, I'll do it. But then the person goes there, you haven't done it yet, you'll do it in your time, just haven't done it yet. But the person in anxiety went there and did it her way or sought help in another person, what she asked from you. You find out whether you're a husband, wife, or child, you don't like it. You say, gosh, I was going to do it. You asked me to do it. I was going to do it. Oh, but you didn't do it. Oh, I went there and did it myself. So then why did you ask? You know, this is just a small example, but it illustrates how you feel insulted, disrespected when someone, when you give your word to someone that you will do something and that person doesn't trust you and goes find another way, turns around and finds their own solution. That's how it is with God, but much more, much more, because God doesn't lie. We can't forget or take long. We can forget or take long, but God doesn't lie. He has his own time, and his time is always the best time. Always, always. It's always better than our will. So it's a big insult for you to think, no, nope, God didn't want, or I'm going to do something now if nothing happens. I will do it my way. It's an insult. Your anxiety, your unbelief in God, contrary to trust. Then you ask Bishop, what do I do then? Do I keep my arms crossed, waiting, only praying and coming to church? No. What do you need to do? What Abraham and Sarah need to do. What did Abraham and Sarah need to do? They had to do what God had said. Go to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. He had to stay. Like Cristiani said, to do his part. He had to sleep with Sarah. Yes or no? Because she wasn't going to get pregnant from thin air. He had to sleep with Sarah. But the rest, the pregnancy, would be the work of God. So... The same spirit has to be within you, that which you cannot do, you trust God, you wait. But you act and do your part while you wait. You work while you wait. Your husband hasn't changed. But what can you do meanwhile? Your husband hasn't returned, your wife hasn't come back, but what can you do meanwhile? I'll ask, if he returns today, if your husband or wife returns today, would you be ready? Have you changed what caused the separation, at least from your behalf? So what can you do while you wait, while God works on your Isaac? You want to marry, you want to find a person. Oh, I want a person that is like this. If we ask you to write down the kind of person, the kind of husband or wife you want, you will make a list. I then ask you if the person you described a appeared in your life would he or she want you are you ready for this person so there are things that we have to wait for but waiting doesn't mean keeping your arms crossed waiting 
means you do your part and trust that God will do what we cannot do. So I'll work while I wait. I don't feel sorry while I wait. I'm not anxious while I wait. I don't blame God while I wait. I work while I wait. If God didn't do something when I wanted, so I see the situation and think, okay, what can I do meanwhile? What can I do meanwhile? It could be that God is allowing this time. It's important for him to do something beforehand so I can do something. So what can I do while I wait? Think about it. Think about it. Be careful with your ways. Be careful with your voice. Be careful with the power of your voice, of nagging the other person. Careful with your anxiety, which is a great insult to God.